Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are you this evening? Kind of cold out there. Thanks for joining us this evening. We've got a special program for you. Before we begin, allow me to introduce tonight's speaker. Mark Johnson is an associate professor at the Institute of Educational Initiatives at Notre Dame. In this role, Mark works with the Alliance for Catholic Education, partnering with middle and high school social studies teachers who serve in under-resourced Catholic schools across the country. In his history interests, Mark focuses on the Chinese experience in his home state of Montana. Previously working in Shanghai, China, Mark brought students with the necessary language abilities to Montana to translate several collections of documents from the state's historic Chinese communities to work to tell the history of Montana's Chinese in their own words. One thing I'd like to say, tonight's program is being recorded, so if you do have a question at the end of the program, make sure you really speak up so we capture that uh, for those who will be viewing this program later. Please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker. Thank you very much, Gavin. I just want to thank the Billings Public Library for having this event and for everybody coming out tonight. I haven't spent a whole lot of time in Billings. Uh, this is how you spend your wild Friday nights in Billings. I, li I like this town, right? Uh, originally from Great Falls, but I live in Helena, Montana now with my beautiful wife, Janet, who's here, and our boys there. So we left the state for 17 years, but wanted to come back to Montana and give our boys, who are 16 and 12 now, a Montana upbringing and be closer to family. So some of my travels outside of the state are gonna inform this story tonight and some of the family that uh, helped uncover this story. So let's get started. So this all started with a request from my mother-in-law, Lucille O'Leary. And what do you do when your mother-in-law gives you a request? You say, yes, yes ma'am. So she was walking around Helena, Montana, going through historic cemeteries, the Benton Avenue Cemetery, right next to Carroll College where Janet and I went and came across this interesting tombstone. And she said, Mark, I'd like you to go to the Historical Society and dig into what you can find at that time. At that time, Janet and I were living in Shanghai, China, teaching over there, but spending our summers in Montana. And so Lucille came across this, John R. Bitzer, a native of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, you know, his dates of birth and death. But the epitaph is what caught Lucille's attention. Here he lies, his life cut short, his death avenged. She thought there was a story there and she wanted me to try and dig into it. And Jess, I think you might remember this from that summer as well. I put the cousins onto it and everybody onto this story to try and figure out what we could find out. On its surface, it doesn't seem to have a Chinese connection, but it turns out when I went to the Historical Society, some documents arose. Turns out this person named Ah Chow, a Chinese man in Helena in 1870, shot and killed John R. Bitzer and then went on the run. Now, there were two different sides to this story. One side of the story, Bitzer died 14 hours after having been shot by Ah Chow, so he had plenty of time to tell his side of the story, and he did. And his side of the story was he was walking home through Chinatown late on a Saturday night after a church service or something like that. I joke a little bit to make my point. But he heard a commotion going on in a Chinese man's cabin, went in to see what was going on and found Ah Chow beating this woman, ordered him to desist. Ah Chow shot Bitzer and then Bitzer wrestled the pistol away and went down to the Cayuse Saloon a couple of streets away. Okay. Other people, though, said that Bitzer was inside this Chinese man's cabin, forcibly dallying with his woman when Ah Chow came home, and Ah Chow shot Bitzer in defense of his house and his wife. Two different sides of things. Ah Chow didn't stick around to tell his side of the story because we know Montana's vigilante justice at the time period, so he went on the run. Bitzer's mining partner, Samson and Macomb, issued this reward. This is straight out of Wild West stuff, right? Dead or alive, $300, considerable amount of money at that time. There was another reward issued that caught my attention, though, issued by the prominent Chinese merchants of Helena, Duck Ao, Ye Wan, and Tong Hing, for $150, not dead or alive, capture him and turn him over to the authorities to be tried. By 1870, there was a functioning legal system in Helena, judges, lawyers, things like that, if he truly was found to be guilty, fine, he'll, he'll pay the price. And so we've got these Chinese merchants issuing this reward and these white miners issuing this reward. When it was all said and done, Ah Chow swung from Helena's hanging tree. And the person who strung him up collected $600. Now I'm a history teacher, not a math major, but the math didn't quite add up. 
He got the $300 reward, the $150 reward, and then hundreds of people who came to see the swinging body, they passed the hat to give the person, the vigilante who killed Ah Chow, this extra money. We still don't really know what happened with, um, you know, whose side of the story to believe. If you'd like to read more about it, it's in chapter one. I think it's a pretty interesting story. But what I decided to do, since I was a high school history teacher in Shanghai, China, with these international students spending my summers in Montana, I thought I'm going to start my year with what's called an inquiry-based project. So have my students inquire into this history, get maps and documents from the Montana Historical Society, and start this project investigating, questioning, wondering, not really knowing where it was going to go, but through this to teach my students who were in history classes the skills of historical research, of in investigation and research and hypotheses and backing it up with assertions and evidence, and they loved it. They couldn't get enough of this. And the Montana Historical Society was sending us information back and forth, and we would send them questions, and they would respond, say, sorry, we can't find anything there, but we did find this map that you might enjoy. We did find these Sanborn fire insurance maps to exa locate exactly where Ah Chow's cabin was. We've got newspapers at the time period. Here are two students who are presenting on a part of the project. The bottom right, you can see those students, and what are they scouring over there? The census, I heard somebody whisper it, the census. And so we thought maybe the census would hold a little bit more information. It did give us a sense of how many Chinese people were in Montana at the time. I always get that question, how many Chinese were there in Montana? The question that I push back is when? Are you talking about now? Not many. If you're talking about 1870, Montana's territorial population was about 10 to 12 percent Chinese. Helena in 1870 was 20 percent Chinese. Right? And so I wanted to come up with this map with the help of a, a cartographer partner on this to show a couple of things in this map. Where they were, of course, any map should show that, but when they were as well. And so the dates, you can see the coding in the top right, and the map's not showing perfectly here, but 1870 is that white diamond, and Helena was at its height at that moment. And then you can see Billings was you know, just under 100 Chinese people in the date indicated there. Butte definitely had the largest Chinese population in all of Montana at what I could peg at 841. It's likely that each of these numbers is an undercounting, a slight undercounting, because census enumerators didn't have the language abilities to interact with the Chinese communities, and to be honest, because of laws that I'll talk about in a little bit, some of the Chinese in Montana and the American West were here in less than legal status. And so they probably wanted to avoid any interactions with government officials. So that 841 for Butte, it probably was closer to 1,000 for Butte. Sometimes you'll hear the number for Butte of 2,532 Chinese lived in Butte. And sometimes people will say, uh, it wasn't 2,500, it was, it was 3,500. No, nah, it was about 1,000. Still a significant population. And this, each of these numbers is capped at 10 or, or more. So there were Chinese in every town and hamlet and township ship across Montana. I was in Glendive last night, and I, I extended the map, and there were eight Chinese in Glendive. And so th this is just 10 or more. I, I do make one exception. I said every town and township and hamlet with one exception, my hometown. Great Falls, Montana was a planned city. If you've been to Great Falls, you know it's got those perfectly rectangular grid street systems. And unfortunately, for my purposes and my interests, Great Falls also planned to be a city without any Chinese. And from its origins in the 1880s, the city fathers and people in charge never really put it on the books, but let it be known that Great Falls would not have a Chinese presence. A couple of Chinese laundry workers tried to establish laundries there in the 1880s and were literally thrown into the Missouri River. It wasn't until 1938 or 1941 when Chinese and Chinese Americans were allowed in Great Falls, Montana. So you'll see that big gap where Great Falls should be as well. But this is just the raw numbers. I wanted to know more. I, wanted, I thought that we could get a deeper knowledge of them, an understanding of their identities, their hopes, their dreams, their motivations. And so we go back to some of those sources that the Montana Historical Society shared with us, particularly the 1870 census. What should a census tell us? What information is collected on a census? Demographics, including race. How many people in a household? Good. Age, occupation? Good. Rashawn, Jessica, Heather, Janet, what else are we missing here in terms of demographic information? Geographic 
Gender, okay. Names as well, all right. Their actual identity. And so we were very excited to dig into the 1870 territorial census. 12% of Montana is Chinese. Let's figure out what it can tell us about the identity of each of these individuals that helps build the state we know and love. So their names are obscured. I won't, uh, I'll be careful to, to use that term only sparingly throughout the night when I'm quoting from primary sources. It's a hate-filled racist term, but this is how the census enumerators characterized the Chinese population of Helena at the time. And so their identities are literally stripped from them and obscured to us in the 21st century, seeming to divorce us from a true understanding of them as individuals, as a community, hopes and dreams, and tra tracking where they moved, tracking what they did, actually putting uh, a life to these people who helped Mon build Montana. So we thought we hit a roadblock, but we did find other sources, but these sources are equally problematic. Oftentimes, the Chinese in Montana rise to us through government interactions that are not quite so positive. From about 1903 to 1906, there were a series of arrests and raids and deportations to try and catch Chinese people and do document checks on if their documentation required in 1894 was in order in 1903, 04, or 5, 06. Okay. Montana's Chinese population declined about 30% in that three-year span. And so they do rise to us in these sources, but they rise to us as the objects to whom things happen, not as individuals with hopes and dreams. So these gentlemen were caught just south of the Canadian border and about to be deported. And so we see them in the newspapers, in the arrest records, in the court files. And oftentimes that's all we can get on the Chinese experience in the West is how they interacted with these laws. And to give a little history lesson here, these laws are numerous. I'm sure many of you have heard of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Okay. It was a definite change to the status of Chinese workers trying to get into America. Back in 1868, Chinese workers were welcomed with open arms by a treaty known as the Burlingame Treaty. In 1868, we needed to build the railroads. The American West is resource rich and labor poor, and so we sought Chinese workers to build this very dangerous project of the infrastructure that connected America. And thousands of them came in. Many of them died building this railroad. They were welcomed in by a treaty. When it was finished by 1882, the door was closed to them. The door was closed to very specific groups of Chinese people, workers. Unskilled workers were not allowed to come in. If you were a merchant, a doctor, a diplomat, a student, you could come in even with this 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. But even earlier, these laws had started against the Chinese. There was the 1875 Page Act, and it assumed that every Chinese woman coming into America was a prostitute. And so it sought to bar them because it didn't want that moral uh, degradation happening in society. That, it was true that some Chinese women in the American West did work as prostitutes, but definitely not all. What this did is it made it very, very difficult for Chinese women to get in the American West, and then very difficult for Chinese families to turn into Chinese American families by having children here. During this time period, the only way, if you're a person of Chinese nationality and ethnicity, the only way to become a citizen in America was to be born in America. It's the only group that was excluded from the process of naturalization. Other immigrant groups could come in and go through the process of becoming a formal American citizen. This was barred to the Chinese until 1943. And so the only way that a person of Chinese ethnicity could become an American citizen was if they were born on American soil. Well, the Page Act made that very, very difficult. For instance, in Montana in 1900, there were 40 Chinese men for every one Chinese woman. Okay. Now, you might say to yourself, well, Mark, a Chinese man does not need to marry a Chinese woman to have babies. Actually, in Montana, they did. It was culturally very difficult to marry outside your race, and from 1909 to 1953, it was legally impossible to marry outside your race. Something called the Anti-Miscegenation Act made it almost, made it, made it illegal for Chinese people to marry non-Chinese people. And so if they wanted to marry, and it was a cultural imperative for Chinese people to have kids, have descendants who could honor their ancestors. It's very, very culturally important, and yet it was made almost impossible for that to happen here in America. And so to find a bride, they had to either send for one from, from China, 
and hope that she could get in under the loopholes of these acts that we're talking about, or actually go back to China, marry, and then come back to America to work, leaving your bride and your family on the other side. Even that was difficult, though, with the 1888 Scott Act. So if you were a worker who had gotten in earlier, gotten in before the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, you should be fine, and you should be able to come and go between the two countries. And there was much more fluid movement than I think we think there was in the 21st century. There was frequent visits back and forth of people, and definitely letters and goods and money were sent back frequently. But the 1888 Scott Act said even if you had gotten in legally, now that the law has changed, you're not going to be able to get back in. And so 20,000 men who were home visiting and home forming families in China were barred from the reentry that legally they should have had. And so this escalating series of laws made it very difficult for the Chinese in Montana and America. And then the 1892 Gary Act, which was a strengthening of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. But the Exclusion Act was at the ports and borders. The Gary Act was at the interior. Government officials went through Chinese communities. The Chinese were forced to have a certificate with them with their photograph on it on them at all times. If they didn't have the certificate, they could be arrested and deported. Before this, the only group in American society forced to have their photograph taken were criminals. And so in effect, it criminalized being Chinese. These Chinese who were forced to carry this, this pass had done nothing wrong. And then if, they, if it was destroyed or if they were out of uh, its possession, they could and were deported. And so as they rise to us in these documents, in this caricatured sense, we've got a caricatured Uncle Sam, we've got a caricatured Chinese person there. They rise to us as the object to whom things happened. And I think it's difficult to tell a complex history if you've only got that side of the story, if you can only find them when they get caught in the cogs of the government bureaucracy. Okay? And so I thought we could get past that. I thought we could get past this. And I wanted to get to know him. He seems far more capable of intelligent, deep thought than this person. Right? I wanted to know what that far off look held. I want to know his name as not just the Chinaman of the 1870s census. I wanted to know his hopes, his dreams, his thoughts, his obstacles, how he collaborated and partnered with other people. Was he connected across the nation? Was he connected around the globe? I wanted to know what we could know about this individual, and we do know him through this work. There's a state lecturer who visits all the societies, and right there I'll stop. All the societies, it, it, it speaks to some level of organization and collaboration. What societies are we talking about? I'm interested. And I've spoken to all of them with the exception of the one in Missoula. This guy's actually from Butte. His name is Hao Si, and is at present in Chicago. He will return in about two weeks, and will then visit Missoula. Well, was this just one individual going out on his own trying to do things, trying to politically organize? No, he was part of a group. And these aren't mug shots. These aren't forced by the government. These are posed photographs taken in the way that they wanted to be seen. And so you see some in Chinese hairstyle and some in Chinese dress, some in Western hairstyle and Western dress. You see all of them wearing this little lapel pin, and I'll tell you about that in a second, but some of them even wearing an American flag pin on their, on, their, uh, on their clothes. And they're proud to be viewed in this way. And there's nine of them here. Well, there's even more of them. This was a group called the Chinese Empire Reform Association, formed in 1899 to try and put the, the Chinese emperor at the top to put him back on the throne. He had wanted to westernize and modernize China to make China a modern power so that it could stand up for itself back home. These guys wanted a strong China, not because of anything back in East Asia. They wanted a strong China who would stand up for its citizens abroad. The Japanese in Montana were not picked on nearly as much as the Chinese because Japan had become a modern power. It defeated Russia in 1905. These guys wanted a strong China so it would stand up for them in Billings and Glendive and Miles City and places like that. And so they organized this Chinese Empire Reform Association and did things like this. There definitely was a branch in Billings. My assertion is that this global phenomenon, which had branches around the world, had the most branches in terms of uh, concentration in Montana, with 12 branches. The one in Butte even had a militia 
They were using rifles with live ammunition to train, to try and go and take back China and show strength to the non-Chinese population here in Montana. I found this an inspiring story. There's one in Marysville, in Livingston, in Bozeman, right? They're all over Montana. And the leaders of this group who were exiled from China visit these Chinese groups in Montana and they're impressed. These laundry workers and restaurant workers and merchants and gardeners showed a strength here in Montana that these exiled people who were visiting these branches around the world didn't see elsewhere. That's a Montana story. It's a Montana Chinese story. We also have a billing story. And sometimes when they get caught in the cogs of the, of the government, sometimes we can hear them speak a little bit. This is a man named Chem Bo. He's a Billings resident. He's a laundry worker. And he was caught without the proper documentation in those raids and roundups of 1904, 1905, like I mentioned. He, he didn't think things were happening fairly. And so the Billings Gazette reports about Chen Bo. I won't dignify this pidgin English that they put into his mouth. I'll try to read it in the way that I think he probably meant it. The American man makes the Chinese man go back home when the Chinese man thinks he has a right to stay here. But the Chinese man will boycott American goods and tell all the people of his country how he was treated here. So Chembo was indeed deported. He thought that that was not right. And he was part of this global movement in 1905 to try and force better treatment of Chinese through the American system. Now, earlier, the Chinese had said, had tried to morally persuade America. So this isn't right. You're just excluding the Chinese. You're letting Italians and Poles and Jews and Russians and Irish and everybody else come in. But you're not letting us come in. That's not right morally. That didn't work. They had fought it legally, taken it up to the Supreme Court. That didn't work. And so they thought, let's fight it economically. Let's try to force, if, if America wants to trade with China, this huge market, let's try and take that away until they treat us better at the ports of entry. And so I dug into that story a little bit, and I found an interesting source from Fort Benton. This is from the Fort Benton River Press. Those of you who read the Fort Benton River Press, you can definitely read that, right? <laughs> No, it's a placard advertising this boycott. And basically what it says is, he who does not support the boycott is a cold-blooded animal. So let's band together as Chinese to try and fight against the mistreatment that we're being subjected to at ports of entry. One of the things of mistreatment was during a specific period of time, any potential Chinese immigrants at the ports of entry were stripped naked and every inch of their body measured and recorded and photographed so that if they eventually tried to come back in and said they were a certain individual, those measurements could be checked to see if you really were who you said you were or if you had sold your identity to somebody else to try and get in. Well, that's a pretty undignified way to treat people who have done nothing wrong, right? And so they fought against things like that, and this boycott actually produced results. In 1906, President Teddy Roosevelt softened the treatment, the undignified treatment of Chinese seeking entry, ended that system of photography and, and, and measurements, and actually transferred the most racist and stubborn immigration officials from places where they would be in contact with Chinese mig uh, migrants. It didn't end Chinese exclusion. That wouldn't end until 1943. But it did make treatment better. And it showed the Chinese in Montana and the world that they had some power. Okay? And so I like any of those moments when they stood up and spoke back for themselves. This gentleman, Quan Loy, is known as the unofficial mayor of Butte's Chinatown. And Butte's Chinatown, with its large population, often came up against mistreatment. In 1896-97, white-controlled labor unions tried to boycott all things Chinese in Butte and force the Chinese out of Butte. Now, I'll talk negatively about that boycott, but I just talked positively about the other boycott. Why? Well, the, chi and the, the Chinese boycott that I talked about earlier was about a policy, right, to try and change policy, and they tried other means. The boycott that we're talking about now in 1896-97 against Butte's Chinese resident was because they're Chinese, because of their skin, their nationality, their culture, things they couldn't really change. And so I think they're a similar economic mechanism, but from two very different motivations. And so Quan Loy, when he's faced, he and his compatriots are faced with this boycott, trying to force them out of Butte, says to his, his people that he leads, do we want to fight this? And they said, yeah. He actually circulated a petition that was signed by over 300 members of Butte's Chinese community saying, you can go into the court, Quan Loy, and speak in our stead. You have our permission to fight this, and we're supporting you. We can't all show up and testify, but know that we have your back. This is one page of many. And so we, we hear their voices in this resistance, and actually the Butte Chinese population won that 
court battle and won an injunction against that type of boycott. Juan Loy rises in other ways as well. He fights for the Chinese ability to practice their religious rites, specifically to celebrate Chinese New Year, Tomb Sweeping Day, and things like that, but most importantly, to return the remains of people who had died here in Montana. For the Chinese outside of mainland China, if you die and your bones are interred outside of China, that's, that's not optimal. You want your bones returned to your native ancestral village so that descendants could honor the ancestors, right? And things would be at peace. And so there were many Chinese in Montana and many of them died. They would be buried and five to seven years after their burial, their bones would be exhumed and cleaned and shipped back to Southern China. It's a cultural imperative, it's a cultural practice. And here we see examples of that happening in Billings and happening in Glendive. Billings actually served as the collection point for North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Eastern Montana. That all Chinese remains would be gathered here to be shipped to San Francisco, to be shipped to Hong Kong, to be then sent back to the native village. But not everybody appreciated uh, that practice. And so we hear Juan Loy coming up against it from a pretty powerful person in Montana. Now, if you remember, I called him the unofficial mayor of Butte's Chinatown, right? Let's see who's telling him that he shouldn't have the right to do what he wants to do. Montana, Attor Montana Attorney General Henri Haskell commented on his perception of res Chinese residents' unwillingness to allow their dead to remain in America, noting that this practice is evidence of their opposition to assimilation. And Henri Haskell said, quote, the Chinese are not bona fide residents in any sense of the word. They will not even permit their bones to have sepulture in our soil. For many who harbored anti-Chinese sentiments, this cultural practice served as further evidence to justify the ongoing prohibition against the Chinese becoming citizens. Answering this criticism, Quan Loy of Butte compared the desire to have remains returned to China as similar to Montanans who shipped their dead back east to rest closer to family members. Quan noted, quote, the bodies of his countrymen are shipped back to China for the same reason that the bodies of eastern people who die here are sent back east that they can be laid to rest beside relatives. And so to stand up for your people to practice their cultural practices, I thought was, was pretty inspiring and, and, and peppers throughout this book to try and find them, find their voice, find their identity. Now, one thing that was really hard to do was to try and find voices of Chinese women. The vast majority of the Chinese in the American West are men. There's not many so sources on them and there's even fewer sources on Chinese women. And so whenever I stumbled across a story about Chinese women, I tried to pick that and, and analyze it and contextualize it as much as I could. And it forms a whole chapter of the book with an interesting Billings connection. This woman here was called Montana's Strangest Social Reformer. And this article appeared in the um, Anaconda Standard, but it's about a Billings resident. And I'll tell you a little bit about her. During the early 20th century, Montana's newspapers celebrated Chinese American women who they viewed as modern and empowered. One such woman was Billings resident Annie Lewis, though newspapers often confused her name for that of the husband she sought to divorce. Her request for a divorce in 1901 here in Billings garnered frequent coverage, with Billings newspapers observing what is undoubtedly the first petition for divorce ever filed in the state in which both the plaintiff and the defendant are Chinese. In addition to her advocating for a divorce, Montana newspapers took interest in Lewis's modern views on Chinese workers. Yet even in an extensive feature praising Lewis for her modern ideals, cultural stereotypes persisted, with the writer describing her as, quote, dainty, petite, and 21 years of age. She's re remarkably handsome for a Chinese woman. The article portrayed her appearance as quite modern before transitioning to the point of the commentary, her views on labor organization across racial lines. Lewis believed that, quote, instead of competing with American workmen, Chinamen will occupy their niche in the world and all will work to a common end, the betterment of the condition of mankind. She secured employment in a Billings restaurant where she is still working and studying for the time where she will start up upon her evangelical work. She tried to join the labor union and tried to allow Chinese workers to join labor unions and be in community with workers of different races to try and advocate for that position in society it wasn't terribly successful, but to have a strong Chinese woman when there's so few Chinese women in the West, I loved it anytime one of those stories emerged. Every time I went into these stories, some interesting things emerged that I didn't know what to make, make of, and here you see some of them. 
These were found at the Montana Historical Society, all in Chinese. What emerged was a collection of more than 100 documents from the period 1880s to 1920s, all in Chinese, letters, bills, prescriptions, maps. I didn't know that at the time because I can't read Chinese too well. And so I talked to the Montana Historical Society. I said, have you ever had these translated? They said, yeah, we tried once in 1988. We contacted a linguist with the University of Montana. He's from China. And he looked at a couple of the letters, and he said, they deal with family affairs, and they're nothing of truly historical import. I agreed with him on the first part. I disagree with him on the second, after we've translated these, these works. And the way that we translated them is I was teaching in Shanghai, China at the time. I thought, I knew a few people who would read Chinese. This is going to be easy. Turns out it wasn't quite that easy. The Chinese language, it's written in a pretty difficult to decipher calligraphy, and it's written at a time period when Chinese characters were written in what's called the traditional form of writing. In the 1950s, the language was simplified. The form of writing was simplified by the communists to try and spread literacy. It worked. But it also divorced 1.4 billion Chinese people from being able to easily read these letters. Instead, what I needed were these people, people of a certain generation, you can see in the, in the center there, or people whose families learned in Taiwan or Hong Kong, where the traditional form of writing is still taught. If you know a little bit about Chinese history, when the Chinese Civil War happened, communists versus nationalists, when the nationalists lost, they fled to Taiwan, but they kept that form of writing alive. And so families from Taiwan learn in the old style of writing. So we tried to translate these documents. I wrote a series of grants to actually bring Chinese students to Helena, Montana, to work for two weeks at the Montana Historical Society, where we digitized some of the documents and sent them back to our research team working contemporaneously in Shanghai. And it was wonderful. Grandmas and grandpas taking part in all of this, trying to uncover this Montana mystery with the China element to it. And it was really amazing. Again, they did deal with family affairs, but I think they are historically important. And they tell us, tell us of a gentleman named De Chuan, who we don't know much about him. We do know that he was working in a laundry in Butte from the 1880s through the 1920s. Okay? The letters that we have, the 100 letters that we have, are all from southern China to him working in Butte. So they testify more to the pressures from southern China and the life conditions down in southern China than they do to his experiences in Butte. I guess I should be saying that. Uh, and he wrote back to the family members, but by definition, those letters are in southern China, and they have yet to emerge. But when we translated these letters, we understood what pressures De Chuan working in Butte was under. He was under immense pressures. The area of southern China that he came from is called Taishan County, and it's where about 60 to 80 percent of all the Chinese who came to America are from. It's an impoverished area that struggled with earthquake, famine, natural disaster, epidemic, civil war, foreign incursion. Life was not easy in Taishan County. It's estimated that 80% of family income in Taishan County during this time period was foreign or earned income. And so the saying was, if the ships stop sailing, the fires stop burning, the cooking fires. Literally, the money he's earning in Butte as a laundry worker is keeping dozens of people alive back home in Taishan, China. And so the letters back and forth say, send more money, send more money, send more money, come home and get married, send more money, send more money, come home and get married. Couldn't get married in Montana with so few Chinese women, but it is a cultural imperative to come home and get married and produce children. He was under intense pressures. Now, there were a lot of boys in his family they should have shouldered some of these pressures. His brother's name is De Shu. So we've got De Chuan working in Butte. De Shu should be out there working as well, sending as much money as he can back home. But De Shu has kind of fallen off the radar a little bit. So let's hear about De Chuan and De Shu. I still cannot find where Brother De Shu is. No news and no money. As soon as you get information about De Shu, please write to tell us so we will not worry too much. You left our country for more than 20 years. Our family eagerly expects you to come back according to the original plan. It would be best that you get married here. We can have offspring for our forefathers and glorify our family. It is a fundamental family tradition. Dushu eventually reappears and isn't doing much. I hope you won't be like Dushu. He does not care for his parents and his ancestors' incense. He wanders outside and has changed his name. 
When he meets his brothers and cousins, he is sorrowful and ashamed. I am writing today to tell you, Bo Chuan, brother, that in our village, there's a piece of land with a house on it. Brother has been working outside the country for many years. I presume that you have a great flow of income from your very good business and that your hands are covered in gold. I am writing today to tell brother to decide on buying the house. We have to think about each other. Be a man, my brother. Your hands are covered in gold. He's working in a laundry in Butte. The records that we translated told us that we, he was actually in deep debt, going into debt in Butte to send every penny that he could back home. And every letter said, send more money, send more money. And this wasn't frivolous. This wasn't so that they could jump up a station in life or buy something new. This was life and death with the earnings that he's making in Butte. Pressures also were exerted on him about his family. We never hear about his father. I assume his father passed away before Du Chuan went out for work, but we do hear about his mother. Our kind mother is in very old age and towards the last few years of her life. If you have made your fortune, please come back home. This way you can repay mother the grace of her parenting and our brothers could sit together, chat, and enjoy being together. I don't think he goes home. And I don't think he goes home because I think he was here in less than legal status. He might have bought an assumed identity of somebody who could gain entry, but he knew that was tenuous, and he knew that if he got caught with that, his earning power and the life-sustaining support that he sent home would be cut off. So he does not go back and forth as frequently as most Chinese in the American West do. We do have one letter from his mother written in 1908. Last month I was very sick but luckily the illness is cured. However, I'm not completely recovered yet, thus money would be helpful. I only wish for your health, but please work hard. This next line, how many times have mothers either thought this or written this to boys working in Butte, or girls? Don't waste your time wandering around in casinos or red light districts. When you get money, regardless of the amount, return home immediately. After that, you may return to work again. And then his brothers continue. Mother is so old and weak now. When you have enough money to purchase a boat ticket, I hope that you can come home to visit and comfort her. It is our biggest wish to see you come home. Then Du Xu actually writes Du Chuan, and you'll notice a change in the tense. He's writing in the past tense here. Our mother had been sick since last June. Sadly, she passed away the evening of September 18th last year. Sorry that I didn't let you know earlier. Please forgive me. He's writing in April of his mother's death in September. When mother was sick, we deposited money for her treatment. It was not enough, and we still owe. We did receive your 100 silver yuan on April 7th. I'm also thankful for the 20 silver yuan you sent to me. Since we still owe money to others, could you please send us more so that we can clear our debts? How I hate that mother has no money for burial. The pressures were never ending on him. This is a microcosm of one man's story through these letters but I think it can be expanded to understand the experience of the Chinese in Montana and the Chinese across the American West. And in terms of the population, we saw a dramatic decline during this time period. These letters span from the 1880s through the 1920s. Montana's population of Chinese declined from that height in 1890 of 2,532 down in the 1950s to less, you know, around 200 or so. Some people who have looked at this story before said, well, they, they never intended to remain here. They weren't able to remain here. Families are so important, and you made it impossible, not you, I'm sorry, the person I just, the government made it impossible for families to form here, right? Also, it was much more active than that. I mentioned that period, 1903 to 06. The arrests, raids, and deportations made Montana's population of Chinese decline by about 30% in those, that three-year period. So it was far more active than just, oh, they, they were here, and, and they, they moved on. They were here. They tried to form a life here. They tried to become American. They tried to become Montanan, and it was made very, very difficult to do that. On that last story, we do have somebody who did become fully Montanan, as you'll see. I assert that he's the first Chinese miner in Butte. Now, Butte's got a long and proud mining history. It goes back to the 1860s. So what would the first Chinese miner in Butte look like? Because for 60 years, Chinese workers were prohibited from working in the underground mines in Butte. That great mining history, and, and those of you who have been to Butte, you know those stories about like there were no smoking signs in 16 different languages. That's true, but never in Chinese. 
the Chinese were not allowed to work in the underground mines in Butte. This man did break that barrier in 1941. Why would Chinese workers be allowed in the underground mines in Butte in 1941? the war. And so you're going to have a couple of things happen with the war. Increased need for copper, decreased manpower with men going out to fight. Plus, China was our ally in World War II. It's pretty unsightly to be barring the Chinese from certain occupations when you're also asking them to fight against the Japanese. And in fact, in 1943, Chinese exclusion ended for exactly that reason. It was unsightly to have an ally that you're also saying is not worthy of coming into your country. And so this gentleman named Wing Hong Hum, he comes to Butte when he was 14 years old in 1933. When he came in, he got detained in Seattle for six weeks for intensive questioning as a 14-year-old. Eventually is allowed in, makes it to Butte, and thankfully for our purposes, he left behind more than 250 letters that talk about his experiences. So what was happening with Wing Hong Hum? He had made a life in Butte. He started as a laundry worker, but again, by 41, he's working in the mines. He was supporting an extensive family back home. Not yet his children, but for Chinese, the family is, is quite extensive, and you have obligations to that family. So he's sending every penny he can back home. But things in Taishan County and things in southern China are very, very bad during this time period. You have the civil war between the communists and the nationalists tearing the nation apart interrupted only by the Japanese invasion, which was horrific for southern China. 250,000 civilians in, in Taishan County were lost and unaccounted for after the Japanese invasion. After the Japanese were defeated, the Civil War resumed, and so this area is torn apart by war. Wing Hong Hum, working in Butte, is desperately trying to get his brother Wing Dun Hum out of southern China to join him safely in Montana. And that's what these letters testify to, back and forth, of trying to get his brother Wing Dun into Montana. And so Wing Hong, working in Butte, is not only working to support the family, but trying to facilitate his brother's entry to America and exit from Hong Kong at this point in time. And so the letters that we translated are mostly from brother Wing Dun from southern China imploring Wing Hong in Butte. And in July 49, things seem optimistic. Wing Dun has just gotten to Hong Kong, and he's quite optimistic that the process will be quick. I'm now in Hong Kong going through the process of applying to go to the U.S. All the formalities should be completed within a short period of time. When you see this letter, please arrange a passport so that I can work, uh, get working on it. Best wishes, younger brother, Wing Dun. That was July 49. Now we go to November 49. I would like to know the status of my application. Is it proceeding? Please be honest with me and let me know if I've done anything wrong. April of 1950. If the passport application is successful, please send it to me immediately so that I may proceed. Right now, the U.S.-Soviet standoff in the Cold War is at a deadlock. At any provocation, war might begin. Please, brother, send it quickly so that obstacles can be avoided. August 53. I beg you to find a powerful Westerner and ask him to be the guarantor of my documents. Please ask the Westerner with his reputation and authority to write a request to the Department of State to accept my application to go to America. Brother, I beg you, I am in a dire situation in Hong Kong. My present chance is slim. In Butte, Wing Hong did find a powerful Westerner in Montana. He tried to get the aid of Senator Mike Mansfield. He did try to facilitate Wing Dun's entry into Montana. Mansfield was not successful. You can't find much more of a powerful Westerner than that, right? But Cold War fears of communist infiltration had replaced the racist fears of the Chinese exclusion law. Four years after that, so now we're in 1957, and this process started in 1949. My humble brother, you are away from home, but are lucky and healthy, holding stable work and earning well. Your brother here is still safe, luckily. From last August, when I went to the US consulate to give the materials and wait for the investigating process for approval to come to America, I've heard nothing. I really don't know the reason. This makes me have the feeling of waiting eagerly without a clear target. There are several countrymen like me. None got the letter or notice. Dear brother, I hope you can instruct the office as fast as possible to help me get the chance to go to America. I'm deeply thankful for all the efforts you make and the precious time you spend. Later, when we meet again in America, I will thank you directly. Wing Dun never gets to America. The brothers are never reunited. 
the claim was that the Chinese would not become American, that they resisted assimilization, assimilation, they resisted Americanization. They kept to their Chinese practices too much. This is Wing Hong Hum in view. He's got a white-tailed doe there in the top left. He's fishing on Georgetown Lake at the bottom left. He's got a brand new car in the top right. That's not a picture of him in the bottom right. That's the first Chinese-American Boy Scout troop in Montana. They look pretty American to me. His brother was never given that opportunity. Wing Hong, in fact, in his w job in the mines, actually became a union member in the Mountain Con mine. You don't get any more, maybe not Montanan, but Butte American than joining the labor union, right? And so Wing Hong had that chance. Wing Dun was never given that chance. What I seek to do in this book is to try and give these people back their identity that was stripped for them in that 1870 census to recognize their dignity, the work that they did to build this territory, this region, this state, the diversity that we once had that was wonderful and beautiful, but that by the laws and the process that I talked about was made difficult to continue. So I hope I've tried to give them back some of that dignity and identity through this project. Thank you very much. I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yes. I'm just wondering, you mentioned uh, some of the work was going back and forth. What would it have cost them to go back to China? I never saw a, a fixed number on that. It would not have been a yearly thing that they did. Um, they would have had to save up for a couple of years to make that trip back. And then they would go back long enough to try and find a wife, to try and father children. So they would be back there for a while before coming back to jobs in the West. I never did see a fixed account of the actual amount. It's a good question. Yes. I thought Hong Kong was under the British Empire. Yeah, it was under the British Empire, but we're talking July 49. We don't know exactly what's gonna happen at that time period, okay? The communists had just taken over mainland China. We're in the process of that. And even in Taiwan, when the nationalists fled to Taiwan, the communists do start shelling and trying to attack Taiwan. So they could have swept all the way over and swept the British out of Hong Kong, swept the nationalists out of Taiwan. We weren't sure. It was a situation of instability. And there were communist infiltrators working in Hong Kong to try and topple that government. Yeah, so you're right. Now we look back and we know stability with the British presence in Hong Kong for a number of decades. There was uncertainty in the 1940s about the status of Hong Kong. Good question. How, uh, how did they send money to China? What transaction took place? Uh, WeChat, I think, is what they used, or PayPal, or Venmo. No. <laughs> Honestly, they used the 19th century versions of that. And so there were three main ways to send money back to China, back to family members. The first and most reliable was to send it with a returning relative, but that was the least frequent. You couldn't count like we just talked about it. Maybe once every two years, if a cousin was going back, if a brother and neighbor was going back, give this to mom, right? The least frequent, though. The next was to hire a courier and specifically deputize that person to take this money to my village. But that cost quite a bit. That was a 5% fee. Okay. The most frequent was to use something called gold mountain firms. And these were the mercantiles, the Chinese controlled mercantiles throughout the American West. For instance, in Butte, it was the Wachong Tai, Wa Wachong tai Mercantile. And these imported different Chinese goods and had a flow of services back and forth. And so you would pay the mercantile a certain amount, a 2% fee, they would collect remittances, money being sent back from the Chinese community, and buy commodities. So they wouldn't just send it as cash. They would usually take all of your money that you want to send back, buy a commodity that they knew was in short supply in Hong Kong, ship that commodity back, sell it for a profit, parse out what was owed to the families, and take that profit. So it was an investment process, a transnational investment process with these Chinese-run mercantiles. Pretty ingenious. Were there laws preventing them from owning property? Yeah, at different times there were laws from preventing the Chinese in many American states from owning property. Now those laws, you know, in 1872 there was a law that tried to prohibit the Chinese in Montana from owning mining claims. It was enforced in a spotty fashion. I mean, Chinese were mining up into the 1890s, 1900s in places in Montana. Again, not in Butte. So it was really dependent on the local situation. They often did not get the first pickings and the best pickings. They were left with what was left behind. We often think of the Chinese in the West working in mining and railroad work. They did. 
by far the jobs they worked most in Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, places like that were laundry work, restaurant work, gardening. Honestly, with the gender balance, not just in Chinese communities, but in the West, there were far few, fewer women than men. And so oftentimes Chinese men took on more traditionally feminized work in society, laundry work, restaurant work, gardening, and things like that. They were economic niches that were left open to the Chinese. But even then, at times, when anti-Chinese forces wanted to push the Chinese out, they would boycott those as well. 1890, 1885 is a particularly dangerous year. Down in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in September, there was a massacre of Chinese. More than 30 Chinese miners were killed. And then ripple effects happened across the West. In Tacoma, the Chinese were expelled. In Seattle, the Chinese were expelled. There were attempts to expel them from Montana. And so those jobs of laundry workers, restaurant workers, and things like that were even in danger. There was an attempted boycott in Dillon, Deer Lodge, Anaconda, Nyhart, Montana, with like three Chinese people, right? Uh, Butte. And so there were often these attempts to even push them out of those jobs that they had been allowed to, to do. That moment in 1885 is interesting because it easily could have bubbled over into actual bloodshed. Please note that I do think an economic boycott is an act of violence if it's being done against you because of your skin color and your race, but the actual bloodshed was close. In Deer Lodge, the Knights of Labor issued this boycott, but they did it anonymously. They put up placards around town in the middle of the night said, we're about to start boycotting the Chinese. You better get on board. Signed, Knights of Labor. 80 city fathers of Deer Lodge wrote an article the next day saying, no, we're not doing this. And they signed their names. I don't think it was because of any love for their Chinese neighbors. In fact, the reasoning they said is, if we allow this to be done to one group in society, what's to stop it from other groups in society? We're not going to allow that in Deer Lodge. And so at, e at many moments of potential bloodshed against Montana's Chinese communities, there were moments where key non-Chinese allies did step in and step up. I think that's an important tale for today. So kind of going off of that and what you just mentioned, were there cities in Montana in that time that had less harsh beliefs, I guess, and attitudes towards the Chinese population? I think it was probably the easiest to be Chinese in Helena. Yeah. Um, in fact, when there was the fight over what city would get the capital, Great Falls put a, a pledge in and say, we want the capital. You know what we have going for us? We don't have any Chinese. Please vote for us. And it was a mark against Helena that Helena had so many Chinese. People who didn't want Helena to be the capital were saying, you really want that place with all its Chinese to be the capital of Montana? Uh, so I think Butte, Butte was kind of, there was, it was the largest Chinese community, but there was a lot of actions against Butte's Chinese. I think Helena was probably the most stable and the least, um, least attacked by anti-Chinese forces. In your research, were you able to find any ancestry that supported your findings or any um, ancestors that stayed in Montana? That's a very good question. There are some Chinese families still to this day who, who persist. Probably the most famous is uh, the, the family, the Tam family that runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte. It is the longest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in America. Let me say that again. Montana has the longest continuously operating Chinese restaurant in America. That's pretty cool, right? But most of the families had moved on. Um, as I do this work, though, I'll tell about the next part of the story. I've got a grant now to kind of take this in, in a different direction. There are four Chinese cemeteries with stone headstones in Chinese across Montana. China Row Cemetery outside Forest Vale in Helena, Montana has about eight. Mount Moriah Cemetery in Butte has about 30. Sunset Hill Cemetery in Bozeman has about six, and Mountain View Cemetery here in Billings has about six or eight. And so we've got a grant to try and get these headstones translated and to try and not only translate the individual's names, but the, the villages they were from. And we've got teams that will work on the ground in southern China to try and reconnect with these villages and help them understand the Montana side of the story, help us understand the southern Chinese side of the story, and bring this back full circle. So maybe connect with some of those those family lines in pretty interesting ways. Uh, in front of you. First and then next. Yes. I was gonna ask, as a, as a researcher, you often enter into your um, project with some, some biases or assumptions about your topic. I'm curious what your students taught you 
or what you learned from them as you went through this process? You know, I think you're absolutely right. Researchers need to be careful about the biases they bring into a project. Um, I think the thing that was freeing about this was we were on no time schedule. What we could do is let, let sources rise to us and then let them speak to us in a way that we could listen and didn't feel pressure to publish. I've been doing this for 12 years. At the beginning of it, I had no idea that a book would be in it because there was just one interesting source. Oh, let's do that this year. Oh, here's another interesting source. Let's do that this year. And let's kind of put the sources against each other and play devil's advocate back and forth and try to be objective. But to just let the sources rise, analyze them, interpret them, and then let, and then figure out what they allow us to assert. Oftentimes, I think researchers go into it with a point they want to make, and then they go find their sources. Instead, we let the sources rise, sat with them, listened to them, and said, what does this allow us to assert? I'd like to think that's how we should do historical research, but oftentimes the, the clock is ticking so fast you've got to publish, 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 and I think it, it hijacks that approach. But you're absolutely right to be careful of those biases. You know, back on that Bitzer Ah Chow story with the murder mystery in 1870, we, we had to ask ourselves, who, whose side of the story do we believe? And then it became, well, why does it matter? Why not tell both sides of the story? Here's one event from one perspective. Here's another event from another perspective. Here's the evidence we have to support both of those. Reader, you decide. And so, reader, you decide. Uh, in front here. Yeah. So my question is really both historical as well as current, in that what were the forces that led, uh, gave rise to the anti-Chinese uh, uh, exclusion act, and are those similar kind of forces now operating in our society? Question but, about what were the forces that led rise, gave rise to the anti-Chinese rhetoric and exclusion and things like that, and to what extent are those forces still present in our society today? You know, I think a lot of times the anti-Chinese rhetoric flared when e economics were not going well. When there were economic downturns, you tended to find a scapegoat and a, a, a someone to whom to direct your anger at your loss of job prospects and things like that. But to be honest, each of these moments of anti-Chinese rhetoric, violence, and legislation, you scratch the surface a little bit and there's racism right there. Economic justifications were part of it, but I think the Chinese culture seemed so foreign to the multinational group of people who came to Montana. I mean, in the 1860s, the world came to Montana, and Chinese came with them. But it seemed so foreign, their burial practices, their dining habits, their customs, um, their skin color. Honestly, I think you scratch the surface of any of those justifications against letting Chinese in or stay, and there's racism right there. Now, unfortunately, I think you don't have to scratch the surface of too many uh, moments of rhetoric against different groups in American society today to find the same thing. I think Montana is a great place to live. I think Montana had a wonderful and beautiful diversity at its origin. And I think we still struggle with who is Montanan today. I mean, you know, over the last couple of years, the number of people moving in from outside of the state, I think, have probably felt some antagonism. I was born in Montana in 1974. Does that give me any greater claim to being a Montanan than somebody who moved here 74 days ago? I don't know. It's, a, it's an ongoing discussion. But I think you're, you bring up an interesting point to look back at this moment in the past through a, a present lens. Yeah. Any, any questions? questions? Yes, sir. Is there any neighborhood here in Billings or in Butte that would have been a, a, a Chinatown type community? Yeah, yeah, I think people in the audience know where would the Chinatown have been in Butte? I'm sorry, in Billings. Minnesota Avenue. Yeah, and I think the building still stands there, the L and L. Plath Law Firm, yep, yep. It was, a, it was a Chinese mercantile, I believe, so they would have been sending those remittances home. Um, s a lot of times you'll hear uh, stories of Chinese tunnels and things like that. That's, there's not much truth to that. There was opium used, and people did use opium in basement cellars and things like that, but there tend to be these stories of Chinese tunnels running under the ground and under streets and things like that. Uh, because they, they give a couple of different reasoning that the Chinese were so persecuted that they couldn't even be allowed to live above ground. That wasn't true. 
So the, the story of Chinese tunnels, I think it's also the story of every Chinese woman was a prostitute. Opium dens, secret societies, Tong Wars, all of this. I think in the absence of sources about the Chinese experience specifically, myth often fills that absence. And we begin to romanticize and mythologize the past. I think we can get deeper to that knowledge. So there definitely was a Chinatown in Billings. I think the um, Western Heritage Center has a, a display currently that speaks to the Chinese experience a little bit. Yeah, the Western Heritage Center, great, great institution. What other questions come up? But there were some truth to the Tong Wars. There, there definitely were Tong Wars, but my point is when we don't have other sources and ways to tell those stories, we can overemphasize that to a point that exoticizes the Chinese. That, that puts them behind this kind of mist that is somehow romantic, I think we can get to a deeper understanding of their actual lives and hopes and dreams. Any other questions? I appreciate you coming out on this beautiful Friday night here in Billings. Thanks to the Billings Library. I'll be selling and signing books up front. Academic books, this is published by the University of Nebraska Press. Academic books are not cheap. It's going for $55, but you've been a good audience tonight. I'll give it to you for $40 tonight, $40 up front. Thank you very much, everyone.